might as well get started. So uh, this is our exam one review. Uh, since you're in 2A and you haven't been to one of my reviews before, here's how it will work. Uh, we're going to do some general topics first. I'll ask you in just a moment, so think about if you want me to cover something. Uh, and when I ask you, I'll list down under the chapter, and then we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, and then, uh, somewhere around five or so, we'll get specific questions. Okay, so people who are done, uh, want to take off, they can. And then people who want to do some specific questions, uh, maybe on practice exams or what have you, then we can, I can cover those specific questions, okay? At a certain point, I'll move, move this group of people over to my office, because I need to start compiling that video so I can post it tonight. It takes a long time, okay? So, uh, for those of you who might be missing, would want to have gone to office hours tomorrow. I mean, pretty much, I'll be around for quite a while tonight. And then, of course, there's TA on the tomorrow. So, I'm curious, and I'll re say this for some people walking in in just a little bit, but if you have any topics you'd like me to cover, you raise your hand, yell it out, and then I'll cover it. Yes? Okay, I think that was this chapter. Simultaneous reactions. Okay, next, yes. Electrolytes. Okay, yes. Percent abundance. And I'll just do isotopes in general. That sounds good. Okay, yes. Limiting reactants. Other topics? Yes. Combustion analysis, is that what you said? Okay. Combustion analysis. Yes. Molarity. Yes. Nomenclature? Sure. Oxidation state? Yep, yep. Others, yes. Precipitates. Can you say it again? Precipitates. Precipitates. We're not really going to get into that on our exam. Are you in my class? Yes. A different class. My class, so yeah, you don't have to worry about that. That's actually the next section after electrolytes. So I'm just saving that until uh, exam two. And th at that point, you'd have to know the ionic equation, typical precipitate, what the state symbols are, etc. Yeah, so no worries for this again. Okay, other topics you want me to cover? Is this good? Cool, last call. All right, for those of you just walking in, here's what we're going to do. This is 2A. I hope you found the right place. Uh, we're going to do some general topics. That's this here. I'll cross them off. I'm pretty sure I can get through all of these. And then I'll dismiss people who are tired and want to go watch TV. And then uh, we'll do some specific questions after that. Maybe there's a question on practice that exam you didn't know how to solve. I'll go over that right afterwards. And then, I guess that's it. Yeah, at some point, I'll transition over to my office where you can stick around for a while. I just want to start compiling the video tonight. Uh, as always, you can always watch videos of topics on my YouTube channel. Or uh, if you don't have them, if you find it helpful, I have a ton of practice exams. And of course, my lecture notes. Is there anybody here who's not in my class? Is this mostly my? Oh, hi. Okay, random ones of you. What class are you from? Topes. Okay. Anybody else not from the Greek god? Yes. In? Oh. Is he teaching two A? Okay. I'm doing two C. Okay, two A. That's good. Anybody else? Yeah. Where are you from? Hayashi. Okay. Is there another two A instructor? No, I guess that's all of us. Right. Okay, cool. All right, well, welcome. You might, I might be further along than you or not as far. Kind of depends. Uh, so just figure it out accordingly, I hope. Uh, and I may have, and it's usually our topics are pretty similar, especially for 2A. You might find something that you went over in more detail or vice versa that I went over in more detail. Okay. So let's cover this action. Let's see, where's a good place to start? An easy place, electrolytes. 
Let's see that. No calculations necessary there. Electrolytes. This, I hope, for my exam, would be a simple question, and even as we go on, it would be a simple question. So an electrolyte is something that will, a good electrolyte is something that will ionize in solution, uh, allowing for uh, good conductivity, okay? So passing through electricity. A weak or non-electrolyte does not ionize and does not allow, uh, is not a good conductor. So this basically splits up into two categories. So generally, you can say something that's aqueous, if you had to guess, was a good electrolyte, and something that is non-aqueous. Aqueous means uh, something that's dissolved in water. Something that's non-aqueous is generally not a good electrolyte. So this would be the strong category here, and this would be the weak or non-electrolytes. Okay? So let's do the weak ones first. Uh, a gas, a liquid, or a solid tend to be non-electrolytes. Organics tend to be non-electrolytes or weak electrolytes. By the way, an organic usually has what elements in it? A carbon and usually a hydrogen. And there could be others, but that's how you recognize an organic. A molecular <laughs> compound is usually a uh, not a good electrolyte. By the way, a molecular, how do you recognize that one? So you'd recognize it because there's no metal. That tends to be a molecular compound. Uh, and then I'll add some more to this category in just a second. Aqueous compounds, those tend to be ionic. Uh, ionic compounds, how do you recognize that? It has a metal in it. Okay, also we call this in chapter five a salt. So a salt and an ionic compound are the same thing as far as we're concerned. Okay, also a strong acid is a strong or good electrolyte and a strong base. Uh, how do you recognize an acid? In Chem 2A, there's an H listed as the first element in the compound. And that's the clear acid. A base, we're going to talk about more in chapter 5, but usually a base has a hydroxide group in it, OH minus. Okay, a weak or non-electrolyte, let me add two more here. So these four would all be aqueous on the left-hand side. These on the right-hand side would be non-aqueous except for two exceptions. A weak acid or a weak base. These would be some examples of things that would be aqueous. However, they wouldn't be good electrolytes. They'd be considered weak electrolytes, okay? So if you know this, you can identify anything as a strong or weak electrolyte. So I want to try some examples, but yes. Oh, go ahead, yeah, no, go for it. Uh, would you have to identify a weak acid or a strong acid? No, that's section 5.3, I think. So on exam 2, definitely. But on this exam, I'll show you what I do as soon as I do an example. Yeah. Right, so uh, this has to be aqueous on all of these. So even if it's ionic, the question is, sometimes you might see an ionic over here. And the reason is, if it's a solid. No, the question is, do you have to know the solubility guidelines? Not for exam one. For exam two, yes. You just haven't learned them yet. So what would you have to know? I would give you the state symbol. And if you saw a solid, it doesn't matter if it's ionic. Only aqueous would be soluble here. So if you see a solid, that trumps anything you see over here on this left side. Does that answer your question? So we're just, we don't know enough information yet in Chem 2A to do a more advanced problem. We will soon enough, so you will get your joy coming to you, okay? So let's try some examples. Uh, I'll just put, uh, yeah, I'll put a check if it's a good electrolyte and an X if it's not. So how about this one? Good electrolyte or not? 
Yep, it's aqueous and it's ionic. No, it's a solid, that trumps. So if you see this, no. CO2 gas, no. H2 gas, no. Water, hopefully you know it's a liquid, no. Okay? HCl, and I'll put kind of in italics after it, uh, if I could write in italics, strong acid. So this would be, yeah, strong acids that are aqueous, and I have to label this as aqueous, uh, would be good. If I put HCl, that's a strong acid, but what if I put gas? Nope. Uh, let's see, let's just do another one. H nitrous acid. This is a weak acid, by the way. Nope. It has to be a strong acid. Okay? So weak acids, weak bases don't count as good electrolytes. So this would not be good electrolyte. That's it. That's it. Okay? So you're looking at state symbols first, and then more specifically, what kind of thing is it? Specifically for the aqueous. The aqueous can go on both sides, uh, just for the weak acid and weak base. So you want to know what kind of aqueous it is. So state symbols first. Second, look at what it actually is. That's it, that's it for electrolyte. Let's move on. Cool, those of you who like to check stuff off, you'll be excited here. Okay, let's do a molarity problem now. Uh, and really there's, uh, for molarity, there's three categories that we can work with, okay? First type of category would be a conversion, what I call a conversion problem. The second type would be a dilution. That would be the M1V1 equals M2V2. And the third type would be stoichiometry, just general stoichiometry, or what you might call titration. So just to review these, if you're a little fuzzy on them, how do you tell them apart? The conversion one is, deals with only one entity, okay? Only one species, chemical species. Uh, and it's asking you to go from one unit to the other. The dilution, what you're going to see is only one species that you're interested in, however the molarity and volume are changing. In the third category, there's going to be more than one species of interest. So in that category, you'll probably see a reaction. You should see a reaction in the third category, stoichiometry. Uh, and it, wants you, it gives you information about one, it asks you about another. All of these can use molarity. Make sure you know what molarity is. It's moles per liter, okay? Moles of what? Solute, solvent, or solution? Solute over liters of solute, solvent, or solution? Solution, okay? So, uh, would it be helpful to do an example? Uh, any one of these are more exciting than the other? Okay, stoichiometry, is that it? Well, okay, okay, all right. Uh, a conversion problem would look like this. Uh, so I'm just making it up so I don't have an answer. You can calculate it yourself. Let's say I had two grams of uh, HCl and I had one liter of it. And I want to know the molarity, okay? So I want to know the molarity. This would be what category? Conversion, because you see molarity and volume are not changing, but I'm dealing with only one entity. So what you're going to do is say, well, molarity is moles per liter. So I want to get there. What I'm going to start with is say, well, I've got two grams of HCl. I can convert that to moles using the periodic table. Uh, and, oh, wait, what? I haven't been in this classroom for a long time. Where the heck are the periodic tables? Okay. Is that good? No. I know there's a button somewhere. Yes. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, HCl, I think that would be, I think chlorine is 35.45, hydrogen would be 1, so I think it's 36.45 for the periodic table. Then there's moles, and I want to divide by, I guess I would put a division sign right there. Uh, one liter. And there we go. That would give me moles per liter, and that would be my a typical question. They can be 
depend on how many conversions they're giving you, it can be more easy. This would be pretty easy slash normal. Uh, if they give you, usually if there's percent masses, it could be a little harder, but this is the general idea. Let's do a dilution one. Dilution, I don't know, this kind of bugs me with students, but it's a, just a formula, but for some reason a lot of students cannot figure this out. I recommend you figure it out, because in lab, you'll always have to do stuff like this. So, uh, what you'll see, it could be, say, HCL again, and say there's, uh, we want a final volume of 500 milliliters, uh, but the stock solution is a 6.0 molar and uh, 20 milliliters, okay? So I want to make a solution of 500. I'm starting with a solution of 20 milliliters and 6 molar. So basically, I want to know the final molarity, M final, okay? Well, that is just, M final is just M2. Okay, let's move this up a little bit. M final is just M2. So I would just plug in, write down your formula again, M1V1 equals M2V2. And let's plug in what we know. Uh, this one here is what we're solving for. The final volume is 500. The initial volume is 20. And the initial molarity was 6. Okay? So you just do a little multiplication. M2 times 500 will equal 6 times 20. Okay, so M2 is going to end up equaling whatever 120 divided by 500 is. Okay? What would be the units of my answer? Yeah, moles per liter of molarity. Capital M is just fine. Is it okay that I don't convert my milliliters? Yeah, because they have both the same units, so that's totally fine. Okay, Should, am I expecting my molarity to go up or down? It better go down because I'm diluting it. That's by definition what dilution means, the concentration is going down. Okay, uh, how many milliliters did I add in lab to make this happen? Yeah, 500 minus 20 or 480. Okay? So get the difference. The final volume is not that amount you add. So read the question carefully to see if we're asking you how much did you add, what's the initial, what's the final. Those are three different volumes. So the initial will be 20. Oh, no, the initial is 500. Oh, wait. No, the initial is 20. Yeah, the final is 500. And the difference, or what was added, is 480. Okay, so this would be the final molarity. By the way, how many sig figs would be my answer? I'd have two because that's four, that's three, and this is two. So two sig figs in my final answer. Uh, if I, oh, for 480, let me say one more thing and then I'll answer your question. 480, how many sig figs will that have? No, it's not exact. It's not two. No, it's not everything. Four is the correct answer. Four sig figs. You want me to write that out? Okay. If you wanted to calculate the volume added, that would be 500 milliliters minus 20, right? This has four sig figs, but what's more important is it's the last digit of the sig fig is in the tenth position. This has three sig figs, but more importantly, the last significant figure is in the tenth position. This subtracts out to be 480, and because these are in the tenth position, all these are significant. So actually, the final answer would be have four sig figs if I asked you how much is added, because you've got to keep the tens position since they're here. So remember, the sig figs, when you add or subtract, has nothing to do with the number of sig figs here. It has to do with the position of the sig figs. Okay, there was a question up here. Yeah. Um, after we um, found the molarity, yes. 
Oh, once you found molarity two, the question is what? Then what? Nothing. Depends what the question was. So the main question was, what's the final molarity? Which is this one. You just have to write this with a capital M next to it and the right number of sig figs, which would be two sig figs. If I asked you, what volume did I add to make this happen? Then you'd have to do this calculation right here. Which is a normal question for me to ask or anybody to ask, really. Okay, was there another question or we're gonna move on? Move on, okay. Next, I wanna do, uh, there's a question on stoichiometry too. You guys are really excited, you wanna do everything for some reason. So, uh, let's write a little reaction. H2SO4 plus uh, sodium hydroxide goes to whatever. First of all, what kind of reaction is this? Double replacement. We've got an acid and a base, or you can think of it, we've got uh, uh, a strong acid and an ion. Either way, you've got strong acid, strong base, or two ionics. That's a double replacement. So you're going to go to sodium sulfate uh, and water. What's wrong here? I better have a two there, right? Okay, what else is wrong? It's not balanced. So I better put a two here, and a two here I think would do it, right? Okay, so now, uh, let's say this is one molar, I'm just gonna make up some numbers in 10 milliliters, and I want to know, and let's say this is uh, 100 milliliters, and let's say I want to know the molarity of this one. This is a pretty typical question. This has to be stoichiometry, or you could also call it titration. You recognize it because it's a reaction, and there's more than one molecule of interest. Specifically, the two reactants are, are of interest to us. And so what we're going to do, there's three steps in any molarity problem. What's the first thing you do? Convert to moles. Second thing you do, use a... Two words, molar, we call it ratio. Third thing you do is convert to whatever the requested unit is, in this case, molarity, okay? So we're gonna start with what we know. I'll do, show this in a different color. We're gonna start here. We're gonna convert to moles. Then we're gonna use a molar ratio to go to this one. And then we're gonna convert to the unit they asked for. Those are our three steps, really, for pretty much any stoichiometry problem. Let's try it. Um, 10 milliliters times one molar, and I'm gonna write it out, moles per liter. <coughs> Once you write it out, you'll notice, hey, the units don't match. In stoichiometry, I must make them match, or I'm gonna screw up. So, one liter over a thousand milliliters. Now, this is an exact number, okay? That does not limit your sig figs. So now, I've just done step one. I've got two moles. Okay, step two is I'm gonna use the molar ratio. There's two moles of what I want, NaOH, for every one mole of what I started with, H2SO4. So here's my step two, or molar ratio. So I'm right here now. Okay, I've got the moles of what I want. Then I have to go to the next line, unfortunately. Oh gosh. I'm going here. Times. Okay, sorry. I am out of space or right too large or both. So, the last thing you want to do is convert to the requested unit. How will I do that? I want to go to molarity. I have mole. What do I need to do? Divide by? Yeah, the liters, here's one problem though, so I'm gonna divide by 100 milliliters. The problem is that's the wrong unit for molarity. I need to take one more step and say there's 1,000 milliliters per liter. Okay, so I'm just merely dividing to get molarity uh, with the right units. Okay, all that calculation, whatever that is, is the correct answer. Okay, any questions on this before we go on? So the last, this step right here, this step here was the conversion to the requested units. 
In our case, it asked for molarity. So we request the unit in our case with molarity. All right, I'm ready to go on. Let's do it. Next, I'll, I'll put this slide back in just a second. I just want to cross something off because we like doing that. Uh, I want to do a combustion analysis since I do happen to have a practice one ready. Let's do a combustion analysis in chapter three. Okay. A combustion analysis is a type of empirical formula problem, molecular formula problem. Okay, it's a subset of it. Uh, so, how do you recognize it? There's going to be a reaction, and what masses will they give you? Actually, there's going to be three masses they, they give you. CO2, water, and the original reactant, the original organic entity or compound. Okay? So in our case, uh, they gave us 29.05 grams of CO2 and 18.02 grams of water. And the original uh, was, the unknown is 15.22 grams. Uh, and I know it, it tells me in the problem I have C, H, and O. Okay? So I'm doing the more difficult version of the type of problem. They can be easier but not harder than this. Okay? And so it wants to know the empirical formula. Well, let's see what it asks here. Yeah, essentially we want to know the empirical formula. Okay? Uh, later we'll tack on a molecular formula question on this. So empirical formula, I want to know what X, Y, and Z are. Okay, uh, let's see, let's try this. So what you're going to do is you're going to start with usually CO2 or water, whichever one you prefer. Okay, so we'll start with CO2 for us. We're going to convert this to uh, moles of CO2, 44.01 grams per mole from the periodic table for CO2. That gets us to moles, but we don't want CO2, that does not help us in the problem. We want moles of carbon. So there's one mole of carbon for every one mole of CO2. And the reason we can say that is there's one carbon atom for every CO2 molecule. Okay, so that's why we can have that conversion. And then uh, this will get us moles of carbon. I think I have that. Yeah, it's 0 0.66, 0 0.66 moles of carbon. Now, what I'm going to do is the same thing for hydrogen. So, uh, let's use a different color to do hydrogen. Uh, I have to start with water because that's where all the hydrogen is. Uh, and that's 18.02 grams of water. I'm going to follow the same pattern. I'm going to convert to moles of water just like above. Uh, we convert to moles first. It's 18.02 grams per mole from the periodic table. And then I don't care about water. I care about moles of hydrogen. So I'm going to put there's two moles of hydrogen for every mole of H2O. Or in other words, there's two hydrogen atoms in every one molecule of H2O. Uh, I did this calculation too, and I got 2.0 moles of hydrogen. Okay, so now I've got the moles. My next step, and I could have done this all in one place, or do it like I'm doing now, but I really, I need moles and I'll also need mass. And the reason I need mass of both of these two is because they tell me there's what? Because of the oxygen, I need the mass of carbon and hydrogen. That's the only reason. So because of the oxygen, I'll need the mass of carbon and hydrogen. So let's do that. So let's start with carbon first. Really, it doesn't matter what order you go in. I know there's 0 0.66 moles of carbon. That's from right up here. We just did that. And then change this to mass, 12.01 grams per mole. And this turns out to be uh, 7.93 is what I got, grams of carbon. Now I'm going to do the exact same thing for hydrogen. Let's do that. I'll use blue again for hydrogen. Uh, just up above, I got two moles of hydrogen right there. So I want this in grams. And so the periodic table tells me 
the atomic mass of hydrogen is one gram per mole, essentially. So this is going to turn out to be 2.016 grams of hydrogen. Again, I need the masses because I know there's oxygen. If there's no oxygen, I wouldn't have to do this one part. The reason I need that is I need information about oxygen, and I'm going to use that information to get it. So I'm going to use this information right here to, get in, uh, to figure out oxygen. What I know is the total moles of my organic compound uh, is our total mass is equal to the mass of carbon plus the mass of hydrogen plus the mass of oxygen. So, uh, the total is equal to the sum of each part. And I know there's only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in there. The total is given in the question. Let's see what that was. That was 15.22 in the question. The mass of carbon I just found, 7.93 grams. The mass of hydrogen I just found, 2.016 grams. Now I can find the mass of oxygen. The mass of oxygen will equal, just with a little subtraction, uh, 5.28 grams. Okay? There's the mass of oxygen. Why that's interesting is it helps me get to the moles. So I can say, oh, 5.28 grams of oxygen, oops, I can convert this to moles. Oh, by the way, before I go on, see that oxygen right there? Is that, for this type of problem, is that an O or an O2? O. Just an O, not O2. We're concerned with the element right now, not the molecule oxygen. So, 16. So don't put 32 here. We will laugh at you, okay? Uh, this turns out to be 0 0.33 moles of oxygen. Now, if I rewind, this is Z, the moles of hydrogen way up here is Y, and the moles of carbon is X. Okay? X, Y, and Z I just found. Let me go to my next slide. Remember, I am trying to find CX, HY, OZ. So I told you the problem the molecule was. Now I know X, Y, and Z. X was 0 0.66, H was 2, and uh, oxygen had 0 0.33. Oh, by the way, let me rewind a little bit just so we can think through something. What if I did this subtraction here for the mass of oxygen and I got 0 0.01? What does that mean? Let's say I got 0 0.01 and I did not get 5.28. That means there's no oxygen. Okay, what if I did this calculation and I got a negative number here? What if I got a negative number right there? That means I screwed up. Okay? <laughs> so, if it's negative, you, you screwed up more likely. Or if it's close to zero compared to the other numbers, that means there's no oxygen. If it's a number greater than zero, and similar to the other numbers, then there's oxygen. Okay? So they really didn't have to tell us if there was oxygen or not. We can figure it out ourselves. Now here, I'm going to divide by the smallest, 0 0.33. So I get C2, uh, H, U, max, savant. Well, I'll do, the, I'll do the easy one, 1. Okay. What's, what's this? 6? That sounds good to me. Okay, what do we call this? This is the empirical formula. Now, I'm going to go back to the question. Let's see if they give us anything, information about the molecular formula. And they do. They say this in the question. The molecular formula molar mass is equal to 46.07 grams per mole. And they want to know what the molecular formula is. Here's what you do. You take this entity right there and calculate from the periodic table its uh, molar mass, I got 46.07. What does that mean? They're the same. Okay, we got that. And that means this is also, this is also the molecular formula. 
So same answer, empirical molecular, and that happens sometimes. Okay? So there's my combustion analysis. Ready to move on? Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. When we find the grams and moles of the carbon and hydrogen, do we care about sig figs? I'll ask you. What do you think? Yeah. Not really. Not about sig figs. I just keep a few digits. And here's why. Why? Yeah, because if you go to here, I'm ending up with whole numbers according to what law? Law of multiple proportions. And that's just a single digit, which is really an exact number. So I know I'm ending up with one digit in the end. That's why sig figs don't matter. But just so you don't really screw up the calculation, I would keep minimum two digits for yourself, if not three or more. Okay, just to make sure you don't make a rounding error. But in the end, it won't matter. Good. Yes. Oh, what if they're not equal? Okay. Let's say, since we're having fun with this, let's say this number was bigger. What does that mean? Where my pen is, that number was bigger, the empirical formula number. That means that you screwed up. Yeah, that number better not be bigger. Equal or pretty similar to, but better not be bigger. This number better be the bigger number, okay? And it has to be bigger by an exact multiple. So for example, if I got not this, but let's say I got 23, okay? And then I would go 46.07 divided by 23, which is approximately two. I better get approximately a whole number. If it's not a whole number, that means you screwed up, yeah. Yeah, this better be a whole number. And then you take this whole number and you multiply through in the subscripts. So in the case, say it was 2, then we would get C4H12O2. C4H12O2. Is that all right? Cool. Oh, okay, last question we need to move on. Is it? Is it possible to get a decimal? Sometimes mathematically, the subscript turns out to be a decimal. You again need to multiply by a number to get a whole number. So for example, if you got 0 0.5, which is a half, I'd multiply by two to get rid of, you should not report an answer with a decimal. I should say that. But in your work, that could happen. It does sometimes. Okay, next. Let's see what's next. Uh, let's do, let's do percent abundance. Next, percent abundance, and move this out of the way. All right, for, uh, really, I want to say an isotope question. There's three categories of questions. They're really the same question, it's the same formula, but there's three ways we can ask the same question, okay? One is we say, hey, uh, what's the, uh, atomic mass, or the average atomic mass, or the weighted average atomic mass. Something about the atomic mass of the element. By the way, that better match what? Yeah. Periodic table, or you screwed up, okay? So, for example, if you're working with iodine, you better get an answer really close to 126.90. Better be really close to that number. Okay, the second way we can ask this question, and this is usually an increasing level of difficulty, not because conceptually, but because of the algebra. So because of the algebra, the next most difficult is usually asking you for the percent, uh, uh, the isotopic mass. Okay, so that's the mass of one of the isotopes. Uh, you, you're at least going to have how many isotopes for any given element? What's the minimum possible rock bottom? Two. Yeah, two or maybe one, if there's only one. Now, what's the upper level? It could be many, many. 
So the upper level could be many, many. The harder, say we want to make the problem mathematically, the more of those we can add. But we might ask you, hey, what's the isotopic mass of one of them? Where would you get the atomic mass so you could use your formula? From the periodic table, or if we want to, sometimes for fun, we just give it to you in the question. Okay. The hardest algebraically will be asking you for the percent abundance. In that case, you would need to know that the sum of the percents equals 100%. Or if you want to go the sum of the fractions, if you prefer to use fractions, equals 1. Okay? If it's this kind of problem, the third one, then we're going to give you one most likely with only two isotopes, because then it gets too crazy. Uh, so that's the types of questions. Make, I would make sure, if you're fuzzy in any way on this topic, make sure you check out one of each of these, and I've had all of these on exam before. All the instructors do stuff like this. Uh, what if I just kind of set up one of these, number, uh, number three here for you, just so you can see what it looks like? Is that helpful? Because that's the hardest algebraically. I'll let you work with the others, or you can ask me after we're done. So let's uh, name an element, pick your favorite letter. An alphabet. No, I, C. C. Oh, well, that's kind of carbon, but that's okay. We'll pretend it's not. Okay, we can pretend it's carbon. That's fine. So let's say we're doing carbon. Uh, no, no. Okay, that's good. Uh, how about X? Cool. Okay. I, should, I should have all this thing, but that was a good letter. Okay, let's say uh, there's two isotopes of X. Uh, 7 and 8, okay? And let's say this has an isotopic mass of 7.012 U, and this is 7.997 U, okay? Uh, and then, uh, what else might I ask? Um, and then let's say the atomic mass, the weighted average atomic mass uh, is blah, 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 uh, uh, 7.53 uh, okay? I want to know both of these percents here, okay? So here's what I would do if I was to know. This is what I want to know, both of these percent abundances for isotope 7 and isotope 8. Set this up, use your typical formula. Remember, this is one of those formulas we don't give you on the exam. You would say 7.533, that's the total, okay? Would be 7.012 times its fraction, I'll go just lowercase y, okay? Plus 7.997, we'll just go in alphabetical order, z, okay? So these two, are these two percents or what are they? They're not percents, they're decimals of the fraction version, okay? So I want to know what Y and Z are, are really their percent equivalents. So I have that equation. What's the other equation I have? What is one. How many sig figs for one, by the way? An infinite, it's an exact number, okay? So now I have uh, two equations and two unknowns. If you forgot how to do this in math, that is really unfortunate. But what I would do uh, is say that this is 7.012y plus 7.997 uh, 1 minus y. Is that too crazy? i just substitute this into here for z. And then now I have one equation and one unknown. I solve for y. Solve for y at this point. And then uh, once I have Y, it's really easy to find Z. Okay? So that's what I would do. Any questions on my algebra here? It's all that, the crazy is all in the algebra. So I get Y from here, and then I can get Z after that. Okay? Uh, again, Y and Z add up to 1, or the percents will add up to 100. Yes? I'll save that one for when I'm finished with the general topics. Yeah, but I'll definitely do that. Here, do this. I will do that. 
once we get to some specific questions, okay? I gotta finish a little bit more. Okay, let's do some nomenclature and oxidation state. Okay, nomenclature, you wanna just do examples? Sound good? Okay, what if I write down a bunch and then I'll do them with you, but you can get a head start if you want. So you don't need to put a mono if it's on the first element, 
but you should if it's on a second element. So CO, carbon monoxide, we don't say monocarbon monoxide, that kind of thing, right? Or carbon dioxide, we don't say monocarbon dioxide. So we don't put the mono on the first element, but you would put it on the second element. Yeah? Oh, why isn't it Huh? Which one, the first one? was why is it called hydrogen chloride as a molecular, really? Uh, that would be if it's a gas. We don't really get into that in 2A too much, so I kind of avoid that topic. But yeah, all the ones that look like acids, uh, I think I did label them when I wrote the exam for this time, and they're all aqueous. Okay, let's go to the next one. Now, all the rest of them are called ionic because... There's a metal, sort of, except for the last one, but the last one's also ionic, because NH4 plus counts as ionic. So this, you just go sodium, or iron, or tin, or ammonium, you just name the first name as is, and the last name, if it's a polyatomic, as is, and I guess I picked all polyatomics. What's this called? Hydrogen. Sulfate, or you could call it, uh, from the book, I think calls it bisulfate. Uh, so this is pretty similar. It has the same last name, but what would be the first name for this one? Iron 3. Do I need to do that? Okay. The sulfate, or the hydrogen sulfate, has what charge? Minus 1, so you need to know that. So a minus 1 and a 3 would be minus 3 total. So to make it neutral, this has to be plus 3. Okay, because this is minus 3, minus 3 times 3. Okay. Minus 1 times 3. So this has to be plus 3 to balance out the charge and make it neutral. Uh, so it's iron 3 hydrogen sulfate, or you could call it there it. It's the higher of the two charges. What's the lower charge? Ferris is plus two. Okay. So the next one, this would be, that's tin, some number. What's the last name? Carbonate. What's the charge on carbonate? Minus two, so this has to be plus two. So it's tin, two. Or, stan, us. That's the lower charge, stanus. What's the higher charge? You call it stanic and it's plus Four. Okay, well, let's try this last one here. The first one is ammonium. I think I already said that, so I gave it away. And this, yeah, I heard somebody say it. Acetate. By the way, uh, let's do a let's do one more just for fun. That's a little discouraging. Let's not do it. Aww. It's okay. I'll do Br minus. That's closer to B. Feels better. Okay. What's the name of this? If you just put that, you'd be marked wrong. Because, yeah, anything with a charge has the last name ion. So it's a bromide ion. Okay. Yeah? Um, when there's, when it's a transition metal, if that's an ion, you have to write the charge for it, right? When it's a transition metal, or uh, even more so, transition metal, or under the staircase, not including aluminum, you do have to write the charge. Yes? Br2, yeah, it's called bromine, and that just has one single name. It's called bromine. H2 would just be called hydrogen. Okay, uh, I think the last, oh, I was going to do oxidation states. Did you want to do like, there's easy, medium, hard. I assume you don't need to do easy. Just the hard ones? Okay, the hard ones are hard. You got that? Okay. All right. Just warning you.
want it hotter, right? Okay. That's, I like this one a lot. Yeah, I would put this on, Jess. It's great. This works. This, uh, well, uh, I need to change some. Uh, I'll do that. Yeah, this will work. It'll work. It's not awesome, but it's good. Good enough. Okay. I want to know the oxidation state of titanium. Okay. How I do these is I just take it apart piecemeal. So, for example, sulfate has what charge? Negative 2. That means this whole thing has a charge of plus 2. Okay? Now, uh, let's get a different color and look at the inside. Each chlorine is minus 1, so really a minus 2. Each cyanide is minus 1, so times 2, that would be a minus 2. Each water is zero. You drink it and you don't die. Okay? <laughs> 2 times 0, uh, so that would be 0. So, here's how I would do this. The, everything in the big parentheses is plus 2. Titanium plus 2 chlorines at minus 1 plus 2 cyanides at minus 1 plus 2 waters and they're both 0. So, titanium minus 2 minus 2 equals 2. Move that over. Uh, titanium is plus 6 in this case. Is that cool? Done? Are we good with this topic? Okay, cool. That's it. That's how you do those. In 2C, you'll have to do this a lot because you have to do this to name it. And you'll be naming stuff like this in 2C, for sure. Okay, uh, I think I'll need to pause right there. We didn't get to everything, but I got to as much as I could. What I'm going to do, uh, for those of you who need to like go home and watch TV or whatever, go for it. The rest of you who want to stay here, I'll tackle specific questions. Okay, so you can stay in your seats, uh, except for those of you who want to leave. In about a minute, we'll resume, and I'll just we'll call hands, and we'll do specific questions. Okay, so for example, 
uh, let's do this one. This is an acid, it's called phosphoric acid. This is actually also acidic. And this is also acidic. But you don't name them as acids, but they are acidic. So this is called phosphoric acid. Anybody, what's that called? Dihydrogen phosphate ion. Make sure you get the ion. And this is called hydrogen phosphate ion. Yeah. So something can be acidic, but you don't name it acid. You just name it as the ion if it's ion. Okay. Yes. Right there. Oh. Took it back, maybe. Okay, yes. Uh, what? What? 660. 60. Okay, that's good. I thought that was a little too big of a book. 60. All right, what number? 21. Oh, gosh. I know why you... Oh, gosh. Okay. This one. This one. Is what you're talking about? Right? I'm not going to do this one. I'll tell you why. I, I put it on some tests and it just people freaked out. It's too, this is the hardest question I found for a, a simultaneous reaction. So I'm not going to do it. It's going to freak you out before the test. I don't want to do that. I would not put something this hard on an exam. Uh, the reason it's hard is multiple reasons, but the multipliers are a little tough. Uh, I would, though, give you this and ask you what the intermediates are. Uh, given that I gave you the overall, but I didn't give you the overall in this question, so I'm just not going to get into it. But yes, it is hard. I understand why you asked me. If you want to ask me afterwards, I'm happy to do it when people kind of clear out. I just don't want to freak out the, the masses. Okay. okay. But I'm happy to do it for if you want. If you can do this problem, you can definitely do any question I'd ever give you on a cell Yes. So, in questions like these, Uh, do you get partial credit, I think is your question. Yeah, yeah, the long answer is you definitely do, but it has to be something of substance. So, for example, you're doing the calculation, you got the wrong answer because you used the wrong number, you'd probably get a pretty chunky amount, at least half of the credit, if not more. Uh, usually what I do, if it's like a five-point problem, the answer is one or two points, and the rest of the points go to the calculation. That's pretty typical. Some of them, though, if it's two points or one point, then there's not as much fun. Okay, yes? Um, on the winter 2013, winter 2013, hold up, I need to find it. Uh, winter 2013. Uh, net ionic equations, no. Uh, you wouldn't need to know that because that's the section after electrolytes. So you'll see it up here, here, because Depending on the quarter and what's going on, we're at a different place slightly. Yeah. Yes? Fall 10. Fall 10. Let me flip over there. Oh, hold up, hold up. That was too much thinking. Okay. You mean this problem right here? Okay, uh, do you want me to actually do this problem or just talk about strategy? Do you want to see how I do it? Or? Okay, so this is, there's usually an A tough balancing problem. This is a Coca Cola problem. Uh, and that's uh, usually worth three to five points. I would recommend you usually do it last, even if you're good at balancing. It's one of the ones you'd save to the end. That's my strategy number one. Do it last. You know it's one of the top ones if it's a sole balancing one. Uh, I wouldn't put it there if I didn't think it was hard because I already gave you the easy ones. So here's, let me write it down. Uh, this one I would consider kind of moderate difficult. It is, it's solvable. SiO2 plus carbon goes to CA3SI2O7. This was on a final exam, by the way. And you know we have common finals, so other instructors were into it too. 
But uh, oh, let's put it on there again too since everybody's coming through. Okay, balance basically is the question. All right, I would start at the messiest looking one. So uh, for me, there's a couple choices on which one I think is the craziest, either this one or this one. It has the most subscripts. I would never start here or here, the carbon of the phosphorus. That would be the worst place to start, okay? So uh, let's balance, since calcium only appears in those places, let's balance the calcium. What is the lowest common multiple between five and, and three? Yeah, I go 15. So this is scratch work. This doesn't mean I'm getting the correct answer yet. So 3 and 5, this is just my first guess at it. Okay? But now, once I have a multiplier in front or a coefficient, I'm not going to mess with it anymore. Um, but I notice now, see my phosphorus is locked down? You see how it's the only place I see phosphorus appear? So how many phosphorus do I have right here? Yeah, 9. So I'm going to put a 9 there. Okay, here's the, I have silicon up here in a couple places, that's unfortunate. Phos, uh, fluorine, though, only appears once. So there's three here. Uh-oh. I could put three fours, that's going to get a little annoying. So now I'm going to multiply everything by four. Because a three four, so I'll just get rid of it immediately. So let's change colors. Uh, I guess I'll go back to black. I'm going to multiply through all by 4. So this is a 12. This will be a 20. This will be a 3 now. And this will be a 36. Is that right? Yeah. A 36, yeah. Okay. All right. What's next? Uh, silicon. Now I can do silicon because there's only one silicon by itself. Okay? So how many do I have here? Just three, right? And there are 40, so 43. Is that okay? Uh, 43. Okay. And then, what will I probably do next? The oxygen, yeah. Okay, here we go. I'll give you a second, and I have to count two. Find out the number of oxygens in the reactant. i got to count this too. Wow, I need a calculator. <laughs> what do you get? 230? 230? 230? Uh, 230? Okay. Okay, that's what I thought. 230 in the reactants. Okay. Minus the 20 times 7. So it's 230 minus 20 times 7. 90. Oh, I guess it's 90. And so this is 90. Done. Boom. Pen down. So it took us about two minutes if you, like, you know, know where you're going. So it's possible to do it in, a, like, less than five minutes, but because people get tripped up, it can take them 15 minutes to figure out. Uh, yeah. Yes. The empty spots? Well, the empty spots are unknown. So it would be like x times 4. And I don't want to deal with variables. But I just know when I multiply the actual coefficients by 4, the other ones are going to be 4 times more than what they would have been. So for example, the CO uh, wouldn't it have been 90, it would be 90 divided by 4 before I did that. But I, I don't need to know that information to solve it. Okay, next. Yes? 17, the last one. Okay, let me write that down. CO2, carbon monoxide, nitrate, 5, print, uh, brackets, 2, so, uh, sulfide. Okay, I want the charge, or the oxidation state, really, of cobalt. So first, what's the oxidate, or what's the charge on the sulfate ion? Minus. Sulfide is minus two, you're right. So, okay, do you see that two there? 
That means that what's in the brackets, not including the two, is plus one. I know you don't like that, so let me just write this. Does it make sense? See, so just like a two here, but let's say I replace it with sodium. Sodium is plus one, right? There's two of them at plus two to balance the minus two. So the same way, what is literally in the brackets, not including the two, is plus one. Okay, I'll assume you got that. CO is... What's the charge on CO? Zero. Yeah, carbon monoxide comes out of your car. Okay. NO3. No. Okay. Yeah, it's the nitrate ion, right? So it's minus one. It's one of your polyatomic ions. So let's set up a little formula. Two cobalts plus one CO at zero plus five nitrite. Uh, nitrates at minus one equals plus one. Okay? So two COs uh, plus zero minus five equals one. Two COs equals six, or CO equals plus three. And we should feel pretty good about that number. Why? It's one of your common charges for cobalt. Three and two are the common charges. Okay, next. Yes? Uh, we did 21 on the same test. Wow, this was a horrible test, huh? 21. Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah. Okay. 42. Fall 2010, number 21. Uh, a and B, or? Say it again. A and B? Yeah, Okay. Let's do it. Here we go. Uh, SiO2 plus carbon goes to SiC plus CO. And determine the limiting reactant when a mixture of 5.00 times 10 to the 3 grams of silicon dioxide and 5.00 times 10 to the 3 grams of carbon react. What is the maximum number of grams of silicon carbide that can form? So essentially, we want the mass of the silicon carbide that way. This is a limiting reactant, even if I didn't use those words in the question, because I have information about more than one reactant. So when I have information about more than one reactant, it's de definitely a limiting reactant problem. So you have to do two calculations. First one, let's do SiO2. Okay, so you go 5.00 times 10 uh, to the 3 grams. And now I use the molar mass from the PR table to the moles. And that's uh, 60.1 grams per mole. This is the moles now of silicon uh, dioxide. Uh, or, yeah, yeah. And then I want to convert, where did I do that? Or did I do this crazy? Yeah. Then there's one mole of uh, silicon carbide for every one mole of SiO2. By the way, is this balanced? No. Oh, that's terrible. Okay. <laughs> I should put a two here, right? And then what here? I think a three, right? That should work. Okay. So that, this is still correct though, regardless, that's good. Uh, I got 83.19 moles, and this is of the silicon carbide. Okay, now I need to do the same thing for carbon. Starting with carbon, so let's do that. Starting with carbon, I got 5.00 times 10 to the 3 grams. Uh, Change the moles, 12.01 grams per mole from the periodic table for carbon. And then there are one mole of uh, silicon carbide for every three moles of the carbon solid. This term, did I cut this? Let's see. Uh, oh, I calculated it in grams, though. Oh, I have it. You got it? Thank you. Four. I just didn't see it. 416, 33, excellent, moles of the silicon carbide. Okay, so which one's my limiting reagent? Top or bottom? 
Yeah, right here, the top one, because I got the smaller answer. Okay? The so smaller answer there. So the top one's my correct answer. I wanted it in grams. Uh, is it okay if I just skip that step and let you convert Wait. this to grams? Okay. Hi. I, I made a mistake. I you made a mistake. Before. Wait, what is the answer then? It's for, I, it's not written, it's for 16.3 divided by 3. It's still bigger. It's 138. <laughs> we still win. Okay, so this is still a smaller number. Is that cool? Okay, cool. All right, so now that's part A. Just change that to grams. Part B. How many grams of the excess reactant, that's the carbon, uh, remain after the reaction is complete? So what I'm going to do is take these moles and move it backwards now. Go backwards. Uh, let's change pen colors here. I'll go black. 83.19 moles of the silicon carbide. Uh, now I want to go back to the reactant in excess. So three moles of carbon for every one mole of the silicon carbide. And then I want this in grams. So one more step. Grams per mole. That's carbon, so 12.01. And let's see what I got here. Hopefully, we read the right number. I think it's 3,003 grams of carbon. Okay? And then, that's not my answer. That's just the amount that reacted. This number better be less than what I started with, is it? Yeah, that's 5,000. This is 3,000. Okay, so I will go 5,000 minus 3,003, oops, and that will give me how much extra carbon I have. Uh, that's going to be uh, an annoying number, 1,997, I guess, uh, grams of carbon. Okay? And uh, then the, you'd have to mess around with the sink fix, that's a little annoying. So, the sig figs, let's see, we have three originally. Three, 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 three. Okay, so this, and these are both at three, so it's going to end up being 2.00 times 10 to the three grams of carbon. That's the amount left over that was on you. Yes? Okay, new question. I'm ready for a new question. Okay, why is phosphate and phosphite? Oh, the number of oxygens are different. That's true. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, why are the number of oxygens different on polyatomic based on the non-metal? I don't have. I have an answer, but not an answer that will answer it. Uh, the answer is uh, the Lewis structure. It turns out to be stable for a different number of oxygens because of the number of valence electrons in the element. But we don't know what that means. Or you so now you have to memorize it. But it's really easier to memorize it because the Lewis structure, to draw it out, unless you're fast, could take you like five to seven minutes. So, uh, They have different number of oxygen, and just because we taught you a certain number of oxygen doesn't mean there's not more. But we just taught you the common ones that are chemically stable. Yeah. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. For those of you who want to stick around longer, I'm going to stop the videotape. I'm going to make my way over to the science lab building if you want to come with me. I'll happily answer more questions as soon as I get this video compiled. Okay? Cool. So we'll take a little break while I clean up.